flag. And then so, got it. I just watch on Zoom. Okay. Okay. All right. We want to welcome everybody again to our IGS Facebook Live. And today we're lucky to have Joy Neighbors with us. And just so you know, go ahead and post any questions or comments you have below the live stream video and we will get to them at the end so but you can post at any time um joy is going to go ahead and introduce herself and we are going to get right to it go ahead joy all right make sure i have everything out. okay hello i'm joy neighbors um i am a tombstone tourist which means that I really enjoy going to cemeteries, uh, the architecture, the um, artwork, everything is fascinating to me. So I have a blog called Grave Interest. I've written for 12 years, uh, just focusing on that kind of thing. And I am also lucky to be the editor of the Indiana Genealogical Journal. And we are going to have another issue, our summer issue comes out in June. So you do have to be a member to get that, but uh, I am sure that Kay or John Marie can tell you all the details about joining that. So if we are good to go, uh, would you like me to share my screen and kick this off? I'm gonna take that yep, as- Go ahead. ahead. You okay. sure can. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, let me see what I have here. Come on here. <laughs> okay. And we are there, correct? Yes. Okay. Looks great. All right. That's what I wanted to hear. All right. So thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, May is National Preservation Month, and we have Memorial Day coming at the end. So basically, this is the best time to explore enhancing the stones, the care and tending of tombstones. Now, gravestones do more than just provide us with dates. They actually offer us clues into our ancestors' lives. But many have deteriorated. Uh, they've been damaged, or they've just gone to the point where you cannot read the inscriptions. So today we're going to discover some clues, basically how we can identify the type of stone that our ancestor has, evaluate the condition of it, also determine some steps in cleaning it if it needs repair what kind of repair and how to preserve those stones for future generations cemeteries do a lot more than just provide us a place to bury graveyards offer us um, a beautiful sanctuary where we can go out it's very tranquil very peaceful but our history is buried there and gravestones offer us all kinds of clues. If we can just understand what the type of stone is, the style of stone, and then we're going to get the information on the front and start deciphering it. We can begin then to understand the demographics and the social classes. Uh, also, we can get a glimpse of that community's history, of their social values, their cultural attitudes, even their religious beliefs. When a cemetery is abandoned or it's basically left to disappear, we lose valuable historical information about the community, about the people. Whether you choose to focus on just your family graves or if you're working uh, regionally to help preserve cemeteries, always remember the first rule, and that is do no harm. Your goal should be to leave that cemetery in as good or even better shape than when you got there. So saying uh, I'm a tombstone tourist, we do have a motto. It's take only photos and leave only footprints. So we're gonna start out by identifying six of the main types of gravestones you can run into in the cemetery. Kicking it off, we have the field stone. Now, these are the earliest stones we used. And literally, this was from the 1600s on. This is that stone in the middle of the field or a rock somebody really liked. Or as the pioneers were crossing the prairie, 
they would get whatever stone they could to mark where they buried a child, a spouse, a family member. Because in our society, it is so important to us to commemorate a grave, to mark it, even though no one or someone could come by and never know who the person is that's buried there. At least we know we did something to mark their spot. These rocks and stones became very much in vogue again when we had the Great Depression because money was scarce, but stones were plentiful. And as you could see here, you could even paint the name of someone on the stone in order to remember them. Slate stones were popular from the 1600s into the 1900s. So slates found mainly in the Eastern United States, Boston, Massachusetts is actually where most of the early American markers were produced. That's where you're going to find that hallmark gray stone. Slate can withstand what they call the freeze thaw effect of physical weathering and it doesn't appear to be too affected by acid rain. However, the stone is porous and that makes it subject to delamination, which is literally the separating of that stone into sheets. And we do still use it today, but sparingly. Sandstone is another one that was very popular from the 1650s well into the late 1800s. It was used because it was available and it was very easy to carve. Now sandstone can range in color from red to a light tan to a dark brown. Spalling or flaking is where the pieces of that stone become detached and that can cause damage. Sometimes it comes off uh, in tiny pieces like little chips of paint. Sometimes it also comes off in sheets of stone. Lichen and mold are the problem because once the sheet of stone starts to come off, lichen and mold go underneath. And then we have the rain and the snow and suddenly that stone is expanding and contracting. And we've got these little live things that are digging into it and will literally ruin the surface of the stone and it will wear away. Limestone, popular from the mid 1700s to about the 1930s. The limestone was much favored in my area of the Midwest, where you can find an abundance of it. There are a lot of limestone quarries in my area of Southern Indiana. Limestone is extremely easy to carve and it ranges in color from light brown to a brilliant pure white. Limestone is terribly affected by severe weather conditions. So acid rain causes a lot of damage to limestone. It can also pit, which are those teeny tiny depressions that you find in the stone, and that will literally mar the surface of the stone eventually. Marble has been used for centuries to build monuments around the world because of its strength and it's just an appealing stone. Marble can be white and have bluish or grayish veins shoot through, or it can be dark like this stone and have more white or gray veins. But despite the strength and the beauty, marble can deteriorate. And again, this is mainly acid rain that's causing these problems. The surface of the stone appears and feels grainy from the acid rain. And literally the lettering begins to lose the sharpness, the crispness, and slowly over time, it will fade away. Granite, well, that's the most durable option for a gravestone now. It's the preferred tombstone style that we use today. There are cemeteries that will only allow granite stones and monuments now. Granite doesn't erode, and for the most part, it is resistant to deterioration. It was once very difficult to carve, which made it a problem as a cemetery stone. But thanks to lasers, it's much easier to do. But granite isn't perfect. Deterioration can begin again when the lettering on the stone starts to erode and then it will lose its definition 
but that will take a long period of time. So the first thing we should do when we go to the cemetery and we're wanting to take a look at those stones is evaluate the condition of the stones. So you look around the graveyard, you determine what condition your ancestors stones are in. That includes if the stone is too fragile to be repaired or even cleaned. So the stone may need nothing more than just a gentle cleaning with soap and water, maybe a soft brush to remove the grass and the dirt, or you may start finding there are cracks, it's broken. There could even be intricate damage uh, from a fallen tree or just careless lawn mowing maintenance, and it may require a detailed plan to fix it. There are four types of damage to stones general dirt and debris, weathering, minor mishaps, and major damage. So when you assess damages, you want to document everything, and you can do that with your cell phone camera. Take plenty of pictures. You want an overview of the plot. You want photos on all sides of that stone from different angles, and then you really want to hone in on where the damage, the cracks, the chips are. So you have a record of what the stone looked like when you began. Go ahead and take photos during the cleaning or the restoration, and you will have then a record of how that repair was progressing and how it turned out at the end. We're going to look at the general dirt and debris and even the vegetation that causes some of the damage. So if you're cleaning a gravestone, you want to have a cautious hand on this. Over time, we've got soil, grass, lichens, moss, and ivy, and they all take their toll on the stones, especially if the marker has fallen and it's been embedded in the dirt. It's rough to figure out what to do with that, but you can clean it. You want to strike a, a balance between the legibility of the stone, preserving it, and the historical accuracy of that stone. Because the patina the stone has, has acquired over years is part of that tombstone's legacy, part of its charm, and we don't want to lose that. We should want our ancestors' markers to retain their authentic look and appeal. But when you use damaging practices or harsh products, then we weaken and we can destroy those stones forever. So when you're cleaning a gravesite, as you can see, we have a stone here for sister that's really embedded in the dirt with some grass on it. You want to trim away all the excess grass, the weeds, if there's vining plants nearby, saplings. You can use scissors and a garden trowel, and you can lift that up just a tiny bit at a time. Be careful when you're removing any plants. Don't grab them by the stem and pull because those roots can go deep and they can affect the marker's integrity, cause the stone to crack, to break, to fall apart. Weathering causes stones, excuse me, we have three types of weathering, and weathering causes those gravestones to weaken and to wear down. The damage can vary depending on the stone type and the marker's location in the cemetery. There are three kinds of stone weathering that occurs. They are physical, chemical, and biological. So for physical weathering, it happens during the natural occurrences such as wind and rain. The direction a headstone faces results in it receiving more or less of the weather damage. So for example, in the US, a gravestone that faces no, north is where some of the worst winter weather comes from. It's going to take the brunt of the elements, and it's going to suffer more wear and tear than markers that face the other directions. Here we have a stone that has some of those little tiny yellow lichens on it. You can see there's a little bit of black mold in the crevices. And instead of the lettering being carved into the stone, it's actually stands out. So that is going to help preserve this stone for a little bit longer. 
In physical weathering, temperature changes can also lead to damage over time. The freeze-thaw effect occurs when we have moisture trapped in cemetery stone, and then the stone expands because we have the freezing weather, and then when it gets warm, it contracts again when the temperature goes above freezing. It's a push-pull effect, but it causes the grave marker to crack, to break, to break. I have dogs to fall apart. Hold that thought. Let's go see. Okay, so it causes it to um, break apart. So the freeze thaw is especially damaging if we have a sandstone monument or a limestone. And you can see where this stone has fallen, it's broken into pieces, and now we've got grass that's growing through those breaks and forcing a separation even larger. So putting that stone back together may be even more difficult now that it's laying on the ground for a while. Likewise, the expansion contraction weathering has the opposite effect, but the same result. So the outer stone surface expands during hot, dry days, and then when it cools off rapidly at night. So this creates stress on the marker. It leads to fissures and cracks, especially in locations like the southwestern United States. Chemical weathering is the second type of weather effect, and it's caused by exposure to the pollutants like acid rain. There's three different types of chemical weathering. We have carbonation, which happens when the rainwater seeps into the cracks or joints, and it really weakens that stone by widening the gaps. The marker then begins to erode on the surface. The lettering will become blurry, hard to read. Layers of that stone will begin to flake off. This again is especially bad for slate and sandstone. The second chemical weathering effect is called hydrolysis. And this is when the acid rain reacts to certain minerals that are in that stone. It causes it to um, decompose and to start pitting. And this can be found on limestone and on marble. This is limestone and you can see that you can not even read what was written on the open pages of the book anymore. And you can see how it's just pitted the entire monument. The third effect is oxidization, and that's when metal interacts with the water and the air. So it leaves stains, or as you can see here, total discoloration of the monument. So think of the Statue of Liberty, made of copper and was once bright, shiny copper colored, but due to oxidization of the chemical weathering is now that greenish teal. Biological weathering, that happens when nature intercedes uh, with that stone, it's living things like vines, lichens, moss, or even tree roots that can damage the structure of the monument and also the surface of the gravestone. Okay, hold on just a moment. We are missing an entire page and that makes me nervous. So I'm going to do this on the fly for a little bit here. Bear with me. We have biological weathering, which is actually what you're seeing right there, where we have the lichens. And we have, again, the green lichens that you can tell it's taking away the shape of that stone. It's the mossy green also. The algae is eating into that stone. And you can see where parts of it have literally fallen apart because it's not being held together well anymore. We have what we call the minor mishaps. And you can see on this stone, the cracks, a little bit of that spalling, that flaking is happening to the stone. This is something that we can keep it together. I don't know if we're going to be able to keep um, what we have on the front in the terms of the lettering but it isn't going to just totally go to pieces on us right now. We're working, we're working on keeping that as well as we can. Then we have the major damage. 
this is where we have the tombstone that has a crack. But if you'll notice, this is where something has hit the stone. So it's cracked the marble at the top, the monument itself, it's cracked the marble base, and it's cracked the first concrete base that we have for this stone. So whatever it was did a lot of damage, and it is really like having a, re uh, having a concussion. So it is going through the entire monument. That may be something fairly easy to repair, but I would contact a conservationist group before I would grab the epoxy and start trying to take care of the situation. We have a tombstone here that has a split in it. And you can see again, we have the yellow lichens on it kind of all over it right now. It's leaning a tiny bit. This is again something that we would want to get a preservationist group to take a look at. People have been so willing to take epoxy and put in the cracks and put a clamp on it and put it together. That's the way we did things for quite a while, just trying to save the stone. But today, those aren't necessarily the preservation tools that we want to use. And each stone is unique. So it will depend on what the stone is, what type it is. Uh, again, the weather in that part of the country where it's located and what's going to be the best for this stone long term. That's what we're looking at when we're fixing them, when we're trying to save a stone. Now, if we have a stone that's broken into pieces, but it's otherwise in good shape, again, it's tempting to grab that epoxy filler and try to fill in all the holes. But again, you need to look and say, well, where did the break even occur? This has occurred down at the bottom. That might not be the best way to fix this stone. It's a large break. We may need to come up with another way to shore this stone up so that it is supported as it sits there. And again, what type of stone? So which way do we approach it based like if it's sandstone or, or if we have limestone or if we have marble? There's different ways to go about that. Now, if the stone has broken at the ground level, it's going to need a new base. And that's complete with a socket that is set into the stone base and then the stone is put over. So if the break is across the middle of the marker or it runs diagonally, the ragged edges have to be trimmed before you fit them back together. And stone pins have to be inserted before the stone specific epoxy is used. And again, we want to make sure even with this epoxy that the color is matching that stone. The stone may have been white at one time, but we don't want to use a white epoxy now. We want to use an off-white or a cream, whatever matches that stone's patina. There is no one size fits all repair. Each one is an individual work that we have to figure out as we go along. And I am very hopeful the days of taking the epoxy tube and squeezing it in and slapping them together are over. Unfortunately, we have a lot of stones like this in cemeteries where well-intentioned people tried to do repairs that were beyond their capabilities. And granted, the stone may be viewed as saved but it wasn't really fixed. I look at this and I'm not even sure the bottom of the stone matches the top. Does this go together or were there pieces lying around and they just put them together? So if you're in doubt, always check with someone who knows how to repair a stone correctly. And please don't puddle. Uh, we did this especially back in the 60s. We'd build a frame and we'd put the cement in and then we'd lay stones in there. And at the time, that's what we thought was a way to preserve them. But when you look at this, these stones don't go together. They're not all one person's marker. We need some expert advice on what we can do if we can even save these stones in a way to exhibit them in an appealing manner. Now, monuments that have been broken from their bases, 
or they're sinking into the ground again are best left to the pros. These repairs require very specialized tools, um, certain equipment designated to lift these fragile stones up, keep them structurally intact while you're making those repairs and then get them back on that base without causing any harm. These cemetery restoration and preservation volunteer groups have taken necessary training and they are glad to help the community as a goodwill gesture. This is the Good Samaritan Restoration Group of Illinois. And I spent a day with them a few years back. They restored several historical markers that were in the Hickory Hill Cemetery in Southern Illinois, um, near a plantation where Illinois had its only slave, um, underground, not underground, let me, how do I put this? Reverse Underground Railroad, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Uh, there was a man who owned a plantation there. It was the Crenshaw Plantation. And he literally would take slaves as they were escaping into Illinois, turn them around, and ship them back down south and make money off of it. So this was a cemetery that needed preserved historically. And these people went out of their way to do it. And for them, it was a labor of love. You could tell this, this was something they were doing, that they were giving back to their community. And in a sense, back to their ancestors. And these groups exist all around the country. Monuments sink. Uh, depending on their age, depending on their weight, what type of ground they've been put on, if they really had a stable base or if they were just set flat on the dirt. So you will find a lot of these and you can see this cemetery, there are a lot of stones leaning here. You may have noticed there are older stones that have sunk into the ground. You can't even read the inscription on the bottom. This is especially true of white bronze monuments. Uh, they are made out of zinc, and though they are gorgeous and they really do not deteriorate, because of their weight, they will sink down. So you will have to, at some point in time, try to boost them back up and put a real base under them because they didn't at the time. This fix on this stone repair, excuse me, requires the base to be placed beneath the stone. And it's going to be a very delicate task of physically moving the stone, not putting too much force on it and putting it back on that base. If you're planning to clean the stones, especially Memorial Day, uh, as I was growing up, that was a very big thing in my family. My grandmother would take me to the cemetery and we would take the scissors and a little bucket of water. And my job was to wash the stones, to clean the stones and trim around them. And then grandma would decorate them for what at the time was decoration day. So if that's what you're planning to do, you might wanna have a cemetery repair bag. Now that can include a spray rig for watering, for washing and rinsing, a soft cloth for wiping it down, a soft paintbrush can be used to sweep the debris off the stone surface and its soft toothbrush can get in those crevices and get in that lettering and get that dirt out. Another useful item to use is a plastic scraper to help lift off any lichens or moss or dirt that has gotten kind of embedded down into the stone. Do not use any tools that are metal. Uh, no wire brushes. They can scratch the stone. That in turn creates fissures and that lets the water and the dirt into the stone. And then we start the freeze thaw effect, which will eventually cause a lot more damage. Now, many of the stones can be cleaned with soap and water, but others require a bit more muscle. And many gravestone and monuments are using, uh, conservationists are using D2 biological solution and they mix it with water. Atlas Preservation Group 
uh, is a group I know that does a lot of cemetery restoration. They are a big proponent of D2. In fact, they back it to the point where they also sell it. They have a video on how to use it. And they have examples where they have used it around the country, not just on cemetery stones, but they have actually used it on some of our monuments and sculpture. So you can really see what a good job it does. And that cemetery folks trust this product. That's the only product I'm going to give you by name to use because everything else, it's skeptical. And even if you're using D2, I would test if it's an old, old stone, if it's fragile, I would do a tiny test where it's hard to see at the very bottom in the back to make sure it is going to work for that stone. The National Cemetery Administration uses D2. They clean the historical marble military headstones. It's used also because it has a retardant and it can stop the growth of bacteria, fungi, and algae on those stones. But again, do your spot check and make sure. Now, another is do not use household cleaners or non-approved commercial or outdoor cleaners. Don't use vinegar. I know it's in the cabinet. You can use it at home on your countertops. Don't use it on a gravestone no bleach, uh, no household cleaners, no commercial spray cleaners, nothing that contains any acid. The first result may be this super white stone, but the ingredients in the cleaners is going to eat away at that surface and they leave a residue that will make the stone decay even faster. And again, We'd rather keep that patina of age than have this brilliant white stone that looks totally out of place in the cemetery. Now, thanks to Frederick Olsted, the father of the cemetery landscaping movement, we have trees, plants, bushes. They make our cemeteries look lush and inviting. But many of the plants we have now are invasive and they're damaging our stones and our monuments. This is why we need to trim away the vegetation. In a cemetery that receives little to no upkeep, you might encounter gravestones that look like this. They've been taken over by the grass or by plants. So first you need to evaluate that situation. Can you clean the surrounding area with a small garden trowel uh, with pruners or maybe even a manual hedge trimmer? Can you carefully use hand scissors and a gentle trial to lift up a little bit of that soil and remove the overgrown grass from the stone? You can see this white bronze is being hidden just because the grass is encroaching over it. If you're going to do any major trimming or cutting, check with the cemetery superintendent if you're in a town or find the county or township trustee officials who oversee that cemetery ahead of time. If it's on private property, you can go to the courthouse and find out who the landowner is to make sure you can go on that property and you can trim it. Ivy is gorgeous. Uh, during Victorian times, our ancestors loved it. They planted it all over the cemetery, not realizing that it would be invasive and it would cause problems. It slowly over time will take over a stone if it isn't continuously trimmed back. Many times a cemetery will want to get rid of it. And literally they need to remove it from the roots. The whole plant has to go because if you see a stone and you try to pull it out, again, those roots go very deep. You could actually damage the stone by trying to pull the ivy or any of the other vining roots out. Now, if you want some great how-to videos to find out how you can uh, trim away the vegetation, remove the invasive plants, and just maintain a natural environment that's better, for your cemetery, 
you want to visit the National Park Services. They have articles, videos. It's fascinating. They do a wonderful job of explaining. And it's a great resource for do-it-yourselfers on how to do it right. Don't take on a project you can't handle. Before you take on any repairs, talk to someone who understands stone restoration. What, again, was once common might today be considered to be harmful. For example, broken stones that were puddled, we don't do that now. Or even bolted back together with metal behind, we don't do that. Uh, today's best practices call for less destructive methods, and we also try to keep the stones visually appealing. Professional accredited cemetery preservation groups are where to go for assistance with questions, with, with needing help. You can search for a conservation group that will preserve a gravestone and keep it accessible for years to come. There's numerous professional groups and volunteer groups, and they have been trained and authorized in cemetery preservation. A cemetery superintendent can assist you in evaluating a gravestone site, and they may be able to give you a list of the accredited folks in your area that could help you. Just a few you can look at online. We have the Chikora Foundation. They're in South Carolina. They specialize in preserving the past, and that does include our cemeteries. Some of their projects include mapping cemeteries, assessing damage, and planning solutions for them. They do grave identification, historical research, and they offer workshops on cemetery preservation. So you can visit their website, which is www.chicora.org, for more information on them. Cemetery Conservatives for the Uni for Uni excuse me, United Standards. I want to say United States. I've practiced all day and I still didn't get there. It's an organization of the cemetery preservationists. It's around the country. And this group is made up of professionals and volunteers who literally promote the education and awareness of the project to give techniques in caring for cemeteries and for the stones. They have videos about how to clean stones, making minor repairs on the markers, and how to contact their members for more help. Then we have Cemetery Preservation Foundation. It's a part of the National Park Service, and they are a wealth of knowledge for cemetery restoration. They provide videos and articles that deal with ethics how to document, uh, how to clear vegetation and overgrowth, how to clean the markers, and what materials you may need for restoration. It's all on their website, and there's also a list you can contact for assistance. There are even preservation podcasts. The National Preservation Institute suggests the Heritage Voices, Historic Preservation Podcast, Curator's Choice, Practical Preservation Podcast, Tangible Remnants. The National Park Service has two podcasts, Historic Preservation, which is excellent, and the Preservation Technology Podcast. There's also Preservation Profiles, Preserve Cast, and Preservation Destination. And again, most states have groups that work on a voluntary basis. It will not cost you anything. All you have to do is check your state's resources for the name of the volunteer groups. They've been trained, and what you want to do is have them come and assist. They give their time freely, and they can help restore the cemeteries throughout your state. A cemetery superintendent, again, can help you find the names, as can other preservation groups. Uh, historical or genealogical societies may also have the names and be able to help you in your search for a group. 
We'll take a quick look here at the close at enhancing the lettering. Over time, that lettering, those inscriptions, literally become too difficult to read. At one time, the gravestone rubbings were done with charcoal and chalk, so you could at least try to save the inscription on that stone before it got too bad, before it disappeared. Some people said that charcoal and chalk worked better to capture, but today we know even the most careful rubbings can cause hairline cracks. And then those eventually go right into that freeze thaw effect and can cause a stone to break. So do not use flour, cornstarch, shaving cream, charcoal, or chalk. Because again, they do more damage, they get into the tiny fissures, and then they can cause the stone even more damage. What has been approved to use is your cell phone flashlight, water, or a mirror. Now, what you want to do with that flashlight, you can use your cell phone flashlight, or you can use a digital camera. But you're going to try to capture the best image you can possibly get, the sharpest image of that stone. And then you take it home. You can digitally enhance these photos later. It makes them easier to read. And another caveat is you can take unknown or unintelligible words, hard text, plug it into Google, see what comes up. When you're photographing a cemetery stone, you want to shoot the marker at the front. You want to shoot the sides. You want to shoot the back. You want to shoot all the stones around it. Get down to that level if you can, so you can shoot directly on, and then you can shoot above. When you are shooting all the neighbors, those could be family members. They could be friends. Uh, they could be next door neighbors, workmates, even church members buried nearby. People usually stayed within their group, and they may turn out to be extremely useful if you go into cluster research to break down a brick wall. Now using water, just fill the spray bottle with normal tap water, and you're going to spray it on that stone and wet the letters. And that makes them stand out a little darker against that stone. You can take the photo, then once you get home, upload it and convert the image into black and white, or you can do a reverse color in the photo editing and make the letters stand out so they're more readable. And then you could use a mirror. Uh, if the stone's lettering is really hard to read, take that mirror and you can direct it toward the sun. And what you're literally going to do, you can see right here what we have from the symbolic past. They show a stone without using the mirror and then they have a mirror. You can see where they're holding it, where the light is coming off. It's bouncing onto the stone and you can literally see much more definition by doing that. As Ben Franklin once said, you can judge the character of a town by the way they keep their cemeteries, their gravestones. Are they looking the best for future generations of tombstone tourists? And I have a book, if you're searching for other cemetery ideas, it's the Family Tree Cemetery Field Guide. Uh, there's all kinds of suggestions on researching on being able to read the language of the stones, of literally tending stones, and being able to make a record and preserve what information you find. It's available online or at any major bookseller. So thank you for that. We have, uh, we're all set now for Memorial Day, I'm sure. And John Marie, did we have any questions? Okay, let me look. Okay. Go ahead and post any questions on the comments. Um, let's see, I don't see anything yet, but I had a couple that I was wondering about. I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, ready? So who actually owns the stone? Is it the family or is it the cemetery? Okay. Um, I have, I have 
talked to a cemetery superintendent about that. The cemetery is the caretaker of the stones, which means they don't want anybody messing with them. So the actual ownership, I'm not going to say is one or the other, but the deal but to work together with the cemetery. Yes. And if you want to make uh, any changes or you want assistance, go to the cemetery office and talk to them. Most of these people know their cemeteries. They know the stones that are damaged. They'll walk out with you. They'll take a look and they will give you ideas and suggestions on what you can do. Uh, if you're just going Memorial Day and you want to sweep up the grass and, you know, trim and, and put some flowers down, that's fine. But if you're going to do anything else, like even take the D2 solution, get hold of the cemetery staff and make sure that that's okay with them because they are the caretakers, the curators of that cemetery, and they take that very seriously. Right. Okay, and then that kind of goes on another thing. So I know in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, for some reason, all our Griner family are buried on the top of a hill. Oh, well. <laughs> and that hill's starting to erode. Oh, no. And so it seems like that would be the cemetery's responsibility. But what if you can't get the cemetery to get involved? Would, would yes. you go to the cemetery erosion projects and maybe they would have? I would, if it's in the city, uh, I would go to the mayor's office. If there mm -hmm. is not a cemetery office to go to, I would go to the mayor's office and explain the situation. Uh, if it is in the country, I would look for um, the county board, or if you can even get down to the township, the township trustees. Uh, all of these government organizations have meetings. So all you have to do is call and say is, when's your next meeting? Take photos, go in and show them and say, now, what can we do to shore this up, to save this situation? And many of them, they know um, there may be state funding available. There may be something set aside, grants or, or another way. Uh, even private individuals have put money aside to help with cemeteries. And that organization, that government group will know where to direct you. If they're saying, well, we're not going to do anything about it, it's up to you, then that's a whole different thing. You've got to let them give you that information, though. And usually they will take it and they will try to do something. Because I noticed like that when we went, like other family members must have gone and they're like shoving stones underneath the slabs to keep them from. Oh, yeah. But eventually those, you know. Yeah. They're going to come down. Yeah. So I would start with whatever government entity is over it. If it's a cemetery that's been abandoned, mm -hmm. you need to try to find the landowner. And well, I know this one is in downtown Grand Rapids. So okay. I mean, it's a big cemetery. I don't you know don't why have they haven't taken it. The cemetery office, then the mayor's office is your next stop. Okay. Yeah. okay. Somebody should, should be doing something to preserve yeah. it. Okay. Let's see. Luann made a comment. Um, she shared a web link here for, I would like to add, look for rocks in a row. I'm not sure she had put a link there. I do not see any of the questions. Do you have any, Kay? Does Kay have anything? I'm, I'm totally good. <laughs> <laughs> Not off the top of my head. Okay, I, that's I, <laughs> I do want to thank you though because yes, that was this was fantastic. It was and so informative. I loved all your your photos that you shared and I just all it. the information. Uh, you know, that's so much goes into it that right. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. folks don't know about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> does exactly and and for everyone watching or who's going to watch on the rewatch this is going to be on our youtube channel which there's a link in our um in our bio so if you guys want to watch it then and then um and then it will be on our youtube channel as well it will be very cool i think we got all the questions okay perfect
Hey guys, it was great. This was fantastic. It Thank was. you everybody for who joined us. We've had a couple of people hop on and on. I think there have been a few that have been here for the whole thing. So, but I mean, this was so informational. This was great. It was. Thank you for your time. Yes. And now we're ready for Memorial Day. So yeah, exactly. exactly. Yep. It's just I around the corner. Like, I still feel like I should do that. You know, my grandmother's been mm -hmm. gone. 50 years and I still every Memorial Day I'll feel like well I should probably go do but I'm so far away now that yeah. <laughs> just, it isn't easy and it isn't nearly the fun it was when I went with her but that's yeah. a tradition a lot of families could mm -hmm. start again or hand down well and it's hard because none of a lot of us have moved away from where our family is yeah. you know that's one reason when um my late husband was buried we did at Arlington National Cemetery because it's always taken care of. I never have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. But there's some cemeteries you just don't know. You don't. And we are getting much better. Um, 30 years ago, it was hit or miss. If states had laws, you could buy property that a cemetery was on and maybe they'd take care of it. Maybe they wouldn't. And yeah. now states are stepping up and, and they are making it a requirement. If you buy a property, and it has a cemetery on it, you become that caretaker. Yeah, so which is great. So it's not disappearing. Yes, and they're yeah. not just, you know, being plowed up or what, it, things have changed and I, I'm so glad they have. Yeah, we have a, a historical society up here in New York, a small one, and there's a small cemetery on someone's property, but the family, it's a family owned cemetery. Yes. But they don't own the property around it, but they're actually leaving the cemetery to the society so that they make sure yes. we take care of it. Yeah. So you just never know. Check with societies too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. So this was fabulous, Joy. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. I love doing it. Mm. And this was like my first trip through. So <laughs> Well, you did fantastic. <laughs> you did. Thank you. Especially you loved your uh, your pooch chiming yes. in. <laughs> Three of them. And I had <laughs> an RV uh, near a lake. So people pass on their golf carts with their dogs. And it was like, okay, it's cold. Nobody's going to go by tonight. <laughs> One person. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. They got their exercise and it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> It just makes the, the show more exciting. The oh, it's live. It's live, yeah. <laughs> It'll forever be preserved on YouTube. Yep, <laughs> sure oh, will. Yes. Well, that's great. If we and don't so have any other questions. Knows, um, next week, or next week, next month's presentation is going to be about organizing your family photos for the future. And um, we are going to be having it at seven, though, instead of six thirty. So just so you all know, um, make a note of that. We'll have the event posted as well. But that'll be a great presentation as well. So if you don't know what to do with your family photos, you're going to want to watch. Sounds cool. But, yeah. Can I stop sharing? Yes. <laughs> sure. Thank you. <laughs> now I can see you're perfect. OK. <laughs> And we'll go ahead and let um, Kate take us off. Okay. All righty. So goodbye, Facebook fam. Yep. Thank you, Joy and John Marie and everyone who who stopped by. Thank you. We'll be seeing fun. you soon. Bye bye.